Hello and welcome to today's Office Hours presentation. This is Paul Hoyt welcoming you to Office Hours presentation number 36. Office Hours is a relaxed, informal mentoring program that I do every Monday at noon Pacific time. And this recording will be available online for a few days. And then all recordings are archived in our members area. This is Office Hours number 36. So almost every week for the last eight months or so, eight and a half, almost nine months, we have uh, given a new presentation every Monday. I spend, you know, probably eight or ten hours during the course of a week designing and developing a presentation and then delivering it live for the first time usually on a Monday afternoon, which is great for me. It gives me an opportunity to be creative and gives me an opportunity to share with you all of this stuff that I have in my head after these many, many years of experiences. The reason why I do that is because I know that being a successful entrepreneur can be a great experience, but I also know that it's tough. You need the training. Not all of my clients survive. Uh, and I understand that there are a lot of challenges in business. I want to do everything I can to help you succeed because when you get to know me, you'll know that I really do care about you. The agenda for today's Office Hours presentation is the same as it usually is. We have an in-depth discussion of a business success principle. When we have some closing remarks, usually some special offers and an invitation for next week's session, and then open questions and answers about typically the topic of the day and then anything that you want to talk about for the balance of the hour. Today's subject is one I'm very excited about, which is called the view from the top, the key performance areas of business. Um, usually I talk about the key performance areas of business at the start of each call, and we try to relate the topic of the day to one or more of the key performance areas. But today we're going to be talking about all of them. So today's call is about all of the key performance areas of business and how important it is for you to have a holistic view of your business, of all of the departments and all of the different functional areas at your business. Today we're going to be talking about a little bit about my backstory and why I came to this understanding and realization. And we're going to talk a little bit about the experience I've had then I'm going to talk to you about the three insights that I've gotten around the key performance areas of business. The first insight, the second insight, the third insight, and then we're going to review it very quickly each one of the seven key performance areas. And then I'm going to talk to you about the magic sequence, or what I think is the most profound understanding that I've ever had about what it takes to start and successfully grow a business. So here's a little bit of the backstory. Before becoming a business consultant in 2001, I worked in corporate America, just like many of you. I had 34 different jobs at 18 different companies over a 36-year career. That's a lot of jobs and a lot of, a lot of companies out there. And in addition to that, I had several other part-time positions. You may think that I was you know, somebody who just jumped, jumped from job to job. I mean, that's literally one new company every couple of years or so and a promotion in the middle of all that. But I was in information systems. So back in the early days of computers, and this was the early days of computers. I started programming computers in 1970. It was very common for somebody to work their way up the career ladder by switching jobs. In fact, the average tenure for a computer programmer or a systems analyst back in those days was about 18 months. About every 18 months to two years, somebody would change jobs because they wanted to work with another computer system or somebody would offer them just a few thousand dollars more. So we had a tremendous opportunity to gain a lot of experience by doing job hopping from moving from place to place. And in my case, it was almost always a step up. It was from a programmer to a programmer analyst to a systems analyst to a department manager to a CIO to having my own business and that's the way that I moved in the early days of my career. Many of the positions I had were close to the top of a business. So as a CIO, as a director of data processing, as the only or the chief systems analyst at, company, at a company, I had an opportunity to see all of the other departments at the company and understand how information flowed through a company, how transactions flowed through a company, what everybody's job was at that company, because I was responsible for designing and implementing the computer systems that supported each one of those job functions. Um, and in addition to working all of those jobs for other people, I've had two professional service businesses of my own. The first one 
was called Springfield Data Systems back in Springfield, Missouri from 1981 through 1985. We sold computer systems and provided services and I was I was very strong in customer service. I was very strong as a programmer and an analyst, but I discovered in the course of that four or five years experience that I really didn't know much at all about marketing and sales. I remember vividly a director at one of the companies that I'd worked with just before I formed Springfield Data Systems asking me how I got along with everybody so well at my company because usually being the CIO, being the director of data processing in a company is a fairly contentious position. And my response to him was that I had a user committee. And that user committee was really made the decisions about which projects that I was going to work on. Um, and he told me and looked me in the eye and said, wow, you really are a great salesman. So I thought I was a great salesman. As it turns out, I wasn't a great salesman at all. I just knew how to play corporate politics. And selling things out in the street you know, to somebody who you never knew before and walking somebody through a sales cycle is a lot different than playing the corporate politic game. But I thought that I knew about sales because somebody had told me that I was good at sales. And as it turns out, I was not. And not only that, I didn't know the difference between sales and marketing. Anyway, after that four years experience, I decided that I really wanted to go back into corporate America where I spent the next 18 years to learn what I needed to learn, to focus on sales and marketing, to focus on plugging my gaps in my experience and my understanding before going back into business for myself. I very intentionally focused on becoming very good in what the areas of weakness were that I discovered when I had my first business. When I have my second business here, the one that I currently have called Hoyt Management Group, I do small business consulting. I started this in Denver in 2001, moved to California in 2007, and I noticed that some of my clients had the same problem that I did, that they were very strong in some areas of their business, but they were very weak in other areas of business. They didn't know what they didn't know, and they took the job without knowing what the job is or what the, what the job was. In almost all cases, they thought the job looked something like this. They thought the job was 80 or 90 percent doing the things that they love to do. Painters thought that the job of being a painter was to paint. Roofers thought that the job of, being, of having a roofing company was to put on roofs. Um, business consultants, coaches think that the job of being a business coach or a consultant or, or just a regular coach was really about being a coach or a consultant. And it's not. What the job really is, is only like 30 or 40 percent at best doing the things that you love to do and every time, all the rest of the time is spent doing that other stuff. Doing that stuff which in most cases you know nothing about. So I wrote The Foundation Factor, which is my first book that I wrote in 2004, and I defined these seven key performance areas of business that I talk about a lot and we're going to go through a little bit later on today, and I identified best practices in each one of these areas uh, to help my clients have a holistic view of their business, a top-to-bottom view of their business, and that's become the basis for many of my consulting engagements. And so this is the familiar diagram that I created a little while ago about the key performance areas of business. As you'll find out in a second, this is really focused on the second insight that I had around the key performance areas. But the first insight was that a company has to be strong in all of these areas of business to thrive long term and that a weakness in any one of those seven key performance areas will slow you down and if uncorrected will eventually shut you down. That came from my experience of being close to the top at $10 million businesses, at $60 million businesses, at $100 million businesses, and understanding that they had a vice president of manufacturing, and a vice president of sales, and a vice president of human resources, and a vice president of finance or a CFO. That they had competent professionals in every functional area of business, and that's the way that they survived, and that's the way they thrived. My first insight was that at businesses like that, that it was like links in a chain. And that if any one of those areas was broken, the company would suffer greatly. And that's very, very true of businesses that are, I would say, have more than $500,000 or a million dollars in revenue. 
The nature of business consulting is all about discovering where your gaps are, which ones of those key performance areas you are least competent in or which are you are suffering in, and finding a way to plug that gap so that the overall company won't look like this broken chain, that the overall company will be healthy and thrive. Um, after a few years of consulting with people about those key performance areas of business, I came to my second insight. And that second insight is represented in this diagram. That second insight is that some of the key performance areas for most companies are more important than other key performance areas. That not all of the key performance areas are of equal importance. And in fact, for most companies, that leadership, sales, and delivery are the most important of all of the seven key performance areas. And in fact, for most companies, I think the diagram should look something like this, that leadership is very important, sales is very important, service and delivery is very important, and all of these other areas, marketing, product development, operations and administration, and financial management, serve to support these three primary areas of business. Because what I found in working with people is if they had a weakness in leadership, if they really didn't understand how to build a team, how to create a successful business model, how to create goals and all of the other functions of leadership, that the whole system would fall apart. It didn't make any difference how good they were in the other areas of business that their system would fall apart. Likewise, you can be good in everything, but if you're weak in sales, if you don't have the ability to to talk to a customer, to build a relationship of trust, to focus in on qualifying your prospects and offering somebody the opportunity to work for, with you and closing deals. If you're weak in sales, the entire system will fall apart. Likewise, if you can sell something but you can't deliver it, if your products are crap or your service just isn't up to par, then your system's going to fall apart, apart long term. I do believe, by the way, that sales is just a little more important than delivery because if you can sell enough, you can have revenue to compensate for product deficiencies and service, but it's not much more valuable. It's really important that service and delivery be managed, be managed the same. And so that's where we came up with this diagram of the key performance areas. Instead of representing these areas of your business in terms of a circle, in terms of links in a chain, we represent the areas in terms of an inverted pyramid, where leadership at the bottom is the most important, and then sales and delivery are the second most important. And then the other areas, I think, are fairly represented as support areas in your business. They're to support the selling of your products. They're to support the delivery of your products. And all of that built upon the leadership, <clears throat> the leadership that you provide to your business. And so it was after I worked with this concept of sales and delivery of being important for a number of years, I came across my third insight. And the third insight is this, that before you can sell and deliver something, you have to have something to sell and deliver. Well, that's, I guess, a little bit of amu amusement, but it's classic in that some people set out to jump into business before they've really decided that they have a quality product or service. So for innovative companies, product development and marketing become the most critical key performance areas, especially early in the business. And for them, the diagram of the key performance areas looks something like this, that leadership being still the most important for every company, leadership is always the most important. But for early stage companies who don't have a lot of traction in the marketplace or don't have a real good quality product to deliver, it's about marketing and product development. And then the other company, other key performance areas become support areas or they become secondary to that. So if you've had a chance to listen to my office hours presentations in the past, I've given a couple of office hours presentations on this subject. One of them was focused around the lean startup methodology and the key concepts in the lean startup movement. And the other one was called Nail It Then Scale It just a few office hours ago that really reflect this insight that if you are an innovative company, if your company is bringing something new to the marketplace, then it's really about focusing on designing your business model, of discovering your, co your customers and developing your products and getting the dog to eat the dog food before you focus on sales and delivery and before you focus on those support functions.
So that's it. That's the three significant insights that I have had. We'll review those here in a little bit. But the three significant insights I've had around the different functional areas of business that I want to sh share with you today. And speaking of sharing with you, I'm going to go through each one of these seven key performance areas fairly quickly because I'm only going to spend a minute or so on them so you get a better idea about what I'm talking about when I talk about leadership and what I'm talking about when I talk about sales, etc. So let's jump right in and talk about what are these key performance areas that I keep talking about and why are they important. The first one, and by far the most important one of anything, is leadership. Leadership is about creating your fundamental business model, understanding what products and services that you're going to sell and how you're going to make your money. It's about getting a great team and aligning that team with your, with your direction that you set, with, with the direction and the vision that you have for your business and the plans that you have for your business. You align your organization and you develop a culture of goal achievement. And you inspire the stakeholders. And the stakeholders is not just your shareholders. Your stakeholders is anybody that you interact with. It's your entire ecosystem. It's your customers. It's your suppliers. It's your employees. It's your contractors. It's your board of directors. It's your investors. It's up to you as the leader to have that winning mindset and inspire everything. And then by far the most important thing about leadership is executing and getting the job done. You have to take 100% responsibility for everything that happens at your business and make sure the job gets done. In fact, that is the very first of the business success principles that I talk about in my Beyond Business Survival program and the most important success principle at all is taking 100% responsibility for everything that happens at your business. That's why leadership is so important to you and the most critical of all of the key performance areas. The next one I talk about is marketing. Marketing is second, not because it's the thing that you ought to focus on second, but because it's one of the most difficult areas of all. Marketing, I believe, is a second just a little bit to leadership when it comes to difficulty, and that's because the world of marketing is changing so much. It's up to you in the area of marketing to understand the needs and wants of the marketplace to select the market segments, the people you're going to go after and find out how to reach those people, to package your products and services in such a way that the market understands what they are and want to buy your stuff. It's about branding and positioning so they know who you are aligned with and communicating the value of your products and services through great marketing messages and great marketing graphics. And the last function of marketing is generating leads. Marketing, as I said, is I think the most critical, one of the two most critical areas and the most difficult of all of the key performance areas, again, because the world of marketing is changing so rapidly. 20 or 30 years ago, it was about TV, radio, and print advertising. And then came the internet, and then came email, and then came uh, social media just in the last five or six years that has really you know, taken everything that we used to know about marketing and turned it upside down. The third key performance area is sales. Uh, and I have to say sales has become one of my very favorite areas. I'm going to give my sales trainer, Eric Lawholm, and friend and partner, and yes, client, Eric Lawholm, a lot of credit for this. He teaches people to be great at sales and teaches people how to be very effective salespeople. And he certainly has helped me over the few, last few years that I've been studying with him. But I say sales is all about lead generation. And you know that Lead generation uh, was also the last of the functional responsibilities of the area of marketing. That's because with some companies, it's the responsibility of the marketing department to generate all the leads. And at some companies, it's responsible responsibility of the salespeople to generate their own leads. So I put it in both places because it's critical. Once you've identified a lead, it's about building a relationship of trust, qualifying your opportunities, developing your opportunities asking for the order, gaining agreement, and getting results. Like the people in leadership, sales is driven purely on results. You can be the most wonderful person in the world and have the greatest activity level in the world, but if you're not closing deals, if you're not making your quota, you're not going to be a salesperson for long. And oh, by the way, if you're the only person at your company selling, then if you don't make quota, then the company's not going to make it either. And that's why sales is so important, especially for young companies that are just getting started. 
The fourth of the key performance areas is financial management. Financial management is about processing your transactions efficiently and in managing your cash flow. In fact, the most important business success principle in the area of financial management is that cash is king, that you have to focus on your cash flow because if you don't focus on your cash flow, you're just flat not going to survive. But financial management is more than that. It's about running your business by the numbers. It's about risk management, which is getting the proper insurance policies, and asset management, which is intellectual property management, security, physical safety, those kinds of things. Managing your funding options, which is understanding how you're going to capitalize this business. For some people, that's just you know a few bucks that they had to start a very small business. For other ones, it's figuring out ways to raise millions and millions of dollars because that's what they need to develop their products and services and take them effectively to the marketplace. And lastly, it's about managing the value of your business. Managing the value of your business so that you can, at some point in time, sell your business or give your investors a great return on their investment. The next key performance area is operations administration, which I call the engine room of the business. It's about all of this stuff that you don't care about much, human resources, information systems and telecommunications, legal services, your relationships with all of your different attorneys, administrative services, manufacturing, kitting, assembly and distribution operations, and your facilities. All of that is kind of in the back room, and all of this is very much always a support function for the other areas, for the other areas of business in which you are engaging with your customers and engaging with the outside world. The next to the last key performance area is product development. That's about creating innovative products and services, managing your product life cycles, and understanding that your, that your products and services should be always in a constant state of repair or remodel or reinvention. It's staying on top of technology and advances in your industry as you, as you go throughout the life of your business, meeting your release schedules and your budgets and constantly improving your design time and quality. Years and years ago, it took General Motors and other car manufacturers years, I mean four or five years before they were able to come out with a new model. And these years, it's like 18 months or two years that from, the, from the time that they decide to bring out a new car it, to the time that they have that new car in the marketplace is sometimes only 18 to 24 months, which is enormously faster than it ever has been before. And that's true with all kinds of product, and especially if your product has anything to do with technology at all, you're looking at more rapid design cycles all the time, shorter design cycles, rapid, more rapid design time. The last of the, customer, uh, last of the key performance areas is customer service which I also call, by the way, service and delivery. And the reason I do this is because it's the point of engagement with the customer. If you have a product company, the point of engagement with a customer, not a prospect, but the engagement point with a customer is the customer service department where they call in or, or send you an email or engage in an online chat so that you are servicing them to help them get the most value from your products. But with service-oriented customers or companies, then it's, it's actually the delivery of service that we call customer service. It's when I do a business plan or do a financial model for somebody, that is the service that I'm providing. My service is my product. And it's understanding that the service, whether or not you're a service company or a product company, is in fact the product. The way that you make your customer feel about themselves whenever they engage with you is the most important business success principle in the area of customer service. It's very important for you to see problems as opportunities. See them as an opportunity to win a customer for life if you help them address a problem effectively. It's about tracking customer satisfaction and then selling and asking for referrals at the point of service. Now, I know that I buzzed through these seven key performance areas. There's no way that you could have gotten, you know, really understood the depth of what's necessary in each one of these functional areas in the last 20 minutes, because that's about how long we buzz through this. And that's one of the reasons I've got these training programs out there, the Beyond Business Survival and the Business Survival Boot Camp, to help you reflect and take a little more time in each one of these key performance areas of your business. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But here's the review of the insights that I've had around these key performance areas now that you have seen them 
in a little bit more detail, and we've lifted the covers up just a little bit and talked about them just a little bit. Here's the insights that it's real important for you as the CEO and the entrepreneur of your business to take a holistic view of your business. If you are incompetent in any one of the areas of business, you will not survive long term. If you don't have adequate financial management, if you don't have adequate product development, if you don't have adequate customer service, eventually that weakness will not just slow you down, it will, slow, it will shut you down. The second insight was that if, leader, if leadership and sales and delivery are strong, you'll have time to correct the issues in those other areas. That's why I tell people as quickly as possible as a business owner, I want you to engage with the marketplace as quickly as possible so you can learn the, the lessons that only the marketplace can teach you and so that you can get into revenue because as long as you're able to sell and deliver, you will have an, an opportunity to correct your deficiencies in the other areas of business. That those are by far, leadership, sales, and delivery are by far the three most important areas of business for almost everyone except for those, comp those companies who don't have a product or service yet. If you don't have a proven product or service yet, then it's leadership, marketing, and product development as being the most important of the key performance areas. So here's the magic sequence that I, that I promised you when we started this out. Step number one is get some education, just like you're doing today. We just touched on the surface of each one of these functional areas of business. And I really strongly encourage you to listen again, if you haven't already, to my Business Survival Boot Camp, and then take the next step in your area of education and get the Beyond Business Survival Program, where we go into depth in each one of those areas of business. Get that fundamental education so that you won't make the mistakes that I've seen a lot of people make and those mistakes that I've made myself, mistakes that will slow you down or shut you down. The second step is to develop your business model and your high-level approach to engaging with the marketplace. Understanding what you're going to sell, who you're going to sell it to, how much you're going to sell it for, what your gross margin is, what your gross profit is, how you're going to reach those markets. All of that is a part of your overall fundamental business model. You design it. And then step three is focusing on marketing and product development and customer discovery. Again, I encourage you to go back and listen to the office hours presentations that I did on the Lean Startup methodology and on Nail It Then Scale It. Um, so that you can understand a little bit more about how important it is to focus all of your time and attention on product development and customer discovery in the early stages of your business. And once you have a product or service, then focus on sales and delivery because those are the key performance areas. And then fifth, fill in the other gaps and build the other areas of business as you can because you're in revenue and hopefully you've got profits so that you can invest in those other areas of business. Now, just a word of caution, you can't really go very far without having a little bit of competence in financial management. You can't go very far at all without having a little competence in product development. You can't go very far with having a, uh, without having a little competence in marketing. So it does take some level of competency in each one of those areas at each step along the way. But here's the magic sequence of things that I want you to focus on, which is most of your time and attention on the areas of business such as marketing and product development, or most of the time and attention once you have a product on sales and delivery so that you can raise those other areas up to meet the delivery requirements of your business. So that's our agenda today. We talked a little bit about my backstory, about how I came to these insights. We talked about the first insight of having a holistic view and how important it is for you to be competent in every area of business. The second insight that sales and delivery for most businesses are by far the most important areas of business. The third insight is that for young businesses, especially those that are innovating, before you can focus on sales and delivery, you have to focus on product development and marketing. We went through and reviewed all of the key performance areas, and we talked about the five-step magic sequence for you to accelerate your growth of your particular business. So here's your homework, and here's your exercise. First of all, I want you to think about where you are in that sequence. Do you have a product that the marketplace knows and wants? Have you even designed your business model yet? If not, then you're at the very beginning 
um, in, in the leadership area of business or perhaps in the product development or marketing area of business. Think about your strengths and weaknesses and then understand which ones of those areas need the most attention right now. And if you need some support, get yourself a mentor or a coach. I think that everybody needs to have a coach. I'm happy to be your CEO coach because I love being a CEO coach. But if you don't get support from me, then get support from somebody else who's competent and really understands really understands business. I want to talk to that about that just a little bit because when I started being a business consultant in 2002, I was pretty darn competent. As you know that I had had you know, 34 positions at 18 different companies over 36 years of experience. So I knew a lot about business. But believe me, I know a lot more about business today after having been a business consultant for 13 years than I did when I started. There's something magic that happens when you work with hundreds of business owners. So don't just get yourself a mentor or a coach. Get yourself one that's been around for a while. At least have that one very seasoned, grizzled guy on your team or gal on your team who will shoot straight with you and tell you, um, tell you exactly what perhaps you don't want to hear but what you need to hear in order to be successful in business. In just a second, we're going to have open questions and answers about the topic of the day and then about any other issues that come up. I really want you to tell me in the chat log here in this webinar session or send me an email if you're listening to the recording. Tell me what your biggest takeaways and insights are from today's presentation. Let me know what you're going to focus on and then post that in our Facebook group called the Brilliant Business Group. Just, just look up Brilliant Business Group on Facebook and send me a request and I'll be happy to let you join that, that group because that's where we support each other when we're not having these office hours presentations during the week. As you know that my approach is, as I said before, I just love being a CEO coach. I love talking to small business owners and entrepreneurs. I'm incredibly passionate about helping you make great progress in your business 90 days at a time. And I'm also passionate about providing that fundamental training that you need to avoid those huge mistakes that will slow you down or, slut you, or, or shut you down in the long haul. <clears throat> and today, I encourage you to call me for a 30-minute th strategy or problem-solving session. During that session, we're going to check in so that I understand where you are in your business. And then you're going to have a question for me. You're going to have a problem that you're dealing with or a decision that you need to make about your business. And I'm going to give you the very best advice that I possibly can in the course of that session. And then we're going to see if I can support you in some other way. Just last week, I had uh, somebody take advantage of this opportunity, and they were stuck in their business. They were stuck uh, not knowing what to do and how to turn next. And in the course of a, just a few minutes of conversation, we were able to get them to, to be unstuck. And they realized that they were not doing everything that they could to, to prosper in their business. They, in this particular case, they were frozen with fear and not making the calls that they needed to, to make and not focusing on cash flow. So we were able to help them get unstuck in just a few minutes. And I'm happy to help you get unstuck too. So who knows what the possibilities are about an idea that I might be able to share with you in our strategy called with each other that will help you take advantage of the opportunities you have, help you get unstuck, and help you move forward in very dramatic ways in your business. Our next Office Hours presentation will be next Monday, June the 16th, and the subject is uh, your business complexity profile. That's another key distinction. Just like no one else out there is talking about key performance areas and which ones of those are most important, um, nobody else is talking about business complexity profiles either. So I'm going to explain what that concept means a little bit and review again what it means that, that some businesses are far more complex than other businesses and how you determine what your business complexity profile is, so that you understand what the job is that you've undertaken when you started your business. Let me know what other topics that you'd like for me to address. You can go to paulssurvey.com or at the bottom of most every office hours uh, landing page that I've got, there's also a place for you to, to enter in what subjects you'd like for me to talk about. You can go to paulssurvey.com and enter those. I really encourage you to do your homework. Think about your gaps. Think about your weak areas, think about what's next and most important for you, get yourself a mentor or a coach, etc. Now we're going to open it up to questions and answers. First, I invite you to uh, offer comments or questions on the topic of the day and then any other issues that you might have. 
and share with us your takeaways and your insights for the call. Uh, and go to paulsurvey.com, and of course, you can always schedule a free time with me by going to schedulepaul.com. Schedule your 30-minute strategy session, or if you're a current client, a 15-minute check-in, or a past client, a 15-minute check-in. I would love to have the opportunity to, to connect with you or reconnect with you. And with that, wow, that was a lot of fun for me. I hope you really enjoyed that a tremendous amount. I'm going to open it up uh, for questions, and I think that we've had a few questions from the call today. I'm joined on the call today by, by Stephanie May, who is one of the members of my marketing team. So, Stephanie, I'm going to invite you to take yourself off of mute and uh, share with me any questions that might have come up during the call today. If you are there, Stephanie, I cannot hear you. And it may be... I am here. There's I you. I am here. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you very much. <laughs> mute um, is such a funny button. Uh, uh, there are a couple questions that have come in. The first one is, um, how do I know which area to pay most attention to? That's something that I struggle with myself. Well, I think it's a, that's a great subject for you to have with your mentor or coach, is to say, you know, what's up for me and what is it that I need to focus on? My approach is almost always to talk about your biggest problems and challenges that you're focusing on right now and also the biggest opportunities that you have. And usually after the end of that discussion comes some very clear definition of things that you want to accomplish in the next 90 days. Um, I really encourage companies to have three to five goals that they're focused on and committing, committed to achieving in the next 90 days with one of the other distinctions I have, which is called a 90-day growth plan, where we define what you're going to do in month one, month two, and month three to achieve those goals. Um, and usually that's the way that you figure out what to focus on next. It's through that discussion with your mentor or coach about writing down what are the top three challenges that you're facing right now and then what are the top three opportunities that you're facing right now and then turn those in to your top three to five goals that you want to focus on for the next 90 days. So that's the way we usually determine what's most important for you right now in your business. Great question. Next question, Stephanie. All righty. How do I fix a gap? Boy, and that really depends on the nature of the gap itself. So, for example, sometimes um, if, let's say your gap is in sales, that you realize, like I did so many years ago, that, that I just wasn't very good at sales. You know, how do you fix that gap? Well, you find somebody that specializes in helping people learn how to sell, sell better. In my case, you know, my favorite partner in this is Eric Lothholm. Um, if, you're, if your weakness is in marketing, it may be in a very specific subset of marketing, such as a weakness in graphics design or in messaging, or it may be in social media, or it may be in brand strategy and development. So you would want to go out and get somebody on your team who's stronger in those areas. In general, at a high level, whenever we fix gaps, we fix gaps in one of two ways. We get the education and the training that we need so we can fix the gap ourselves, or we go hire somebody on our team who has expertise in that specific area and invite them to join our team and help us fix the gap or fix the gap for us. So one of those two ways, education and training so we can do it ourselves or through hiring people for our team so that they can help us close the gaps because they've got the expertise that they need. I think that's the, the best answer there. Uh, next question, Stephanie. All righty. How long does it take to be good at everything? <laughs> I'm still working on that one. So 36 years of experience now with, coupled with, you know, another 13 years of experience as a business consultant. That's a lot of years of experience. And that's by the way, that really is true because I started, I, I may even be more than that because I was out, you know, mowing lawns and earning five bucks here and there or shoveling snow or raking leaves or you know, I think I started my first W-2 job at the age of 14 back in Wichita, Kansas, and 14 was a long time ago for me, a long time ago for me. So I'm still working at it. So the, I think the best answer to that is that you never stop getting better. 
you never stop getting better at leadership. You never stop getting better at marketing. You never stop getting better at sales. You never stop getting better at any of the areas of business. As the marketplace around you changes, as technology changes, as the nature of your business changes, as it's your competitive position changes, as the world is constantly changing and we're constantly adapting and adopting new behaviors and attitudes and techniques to be able to survive and thrive in the new world of today. And there's always a new world today. Tomorrow, you know, one year from now, somebody's going to come along with some new social media thing that's going to be taken off and you know, everybody's going to gravitate to that. There's going to be a new way of delivering products and services virtually, holographically, three-dimensionally, who knows what the new, you know, the new technology is going to, going to bring. So I think the best answer to that, you know, how long does it take is that uh, a lifetime, your lifetime, the lifetime of your business. You'll constantly be finding gaps, finding ways to improve your performance in one area of business or another, and taking steps as a good leader, taking steps to identify those weaknesses, finding ways to close the gaps, and work on continually making your business strong and healthy. Great question. Next question, Stephanie. Beautiful. Well, this is one that there are a lot of it, there are a lot of teachers out there. How come there are there isn't anybody else teaching these concepts? Well, that's a good one. I think because you know, I, I would say that I don't know, but. But I think the real answer is that we only see what we can see. You know, when I was working for myself before I went into business for the first time at the tender age of 29 or so in 1981, maybe I was 30 in 1981, um, you know, I only knew what I knew. We can only teach what we know for ourselves. Later on, when I first started being a business consultant in 2001, I taught what I knew then, which was that first insight about how important it was for strong companies to be to be uh, competent or really to be exceptional in all of the areas of business. And then comes additional insights and then comes additional insights. So now I've got the insights that only, you know, 50 years of business experience can teach me. I've got the insights that only working with hundreds of business owners could teach me. And so I share those insights with you. So I, I like it is with all areas of life. We teach what we know. We teach what has been been meaningful to us in our own personal experience and my guess is that not many people have had the experience that I have had. I'll also say that many business, two other problems I talked about in one of my previous office hours presentations that many small business owners face is that number one is that most business consultants don't work with this market. Most business consultants work with companies with five or ten to a hundred million dollars and more. The reason that they work with that market is because that market pays a lot better and that market is a lot easier to work with. So, so I've oftentimes asked myself, and I've had other people ask me, Paul, why do you keep working with startup businesses when there's so much more money to be had and so much, it's so much easier working with larger companies? And the answer is, I love small business owners. I just care about people who have this dream and they want to pursue their dream and I want to give them the best support that they can. So there's not a lot of co business consultants who have my level of experience focusing on this market because frankly it's tough to focus on this market. The other reason is that most business consultants are specialists. They specialize in branding, they specialize in marketing, they specialize in you know, financial management, they specialize in product development and they don't see the big picture or have that same general sense of experience that I have that came from my years and years of working in information systems and then my years of helping hundreds of business owners focus on their business. So I think that's it. I, I'm, I'm a more of a generalist than I am a specialist. I focus on this market where many business consultants do not and that I've had so much experience that I can share with other people. Next question, Stephanie. Um, this is one that frustrates me a lot, and that you have urgent, not urgent, very important, semi-important, and with all of the tasks and, and things on the agenda, trying to figure out what do I do first and how to focus 
how to focus on on all those daily tasks. How do I know what to do first? I've heard you speak of sequencing many times. I uh, I teach people one of my favorite techniques, which I call the 60-30-10 model, which means that for some period of time, for some people that's a month, for some people that's a week, for some people that's a day, and for some people that's just the next couple of hours, I'm going to focus 60% of my time and attention on my number one priority, 30% of my time and attention on number two priority, and 10% of my time and attention on the third priority and everything else is going into the parking lot for the duration of this time period, whatever that happens to be. Um, so for the rest of the day, for example, for this afternoon, you may decide for the next four hours, my number one priority is going to be sales. I'm going to focus 60% of my time on sales and that means two and a half hours out of the next four hours, I'm going to focus in on sales. And my second priority for the, just the next four hours or so is going to be on getting stuff done for a client. So I'm going to focus, you know, another hour or so on a client, on, on what I need to be doing for a client. And then the rest of the third 30 minutes that's left out of those four hours, I'm going to focus on whatever my number three priority is. So I teach people the 60-30-10 model that works extremely well for me because, because it's not easy for some people to just let go of everything and focus on only one thing for the next period of time. Um, it's easier for them to think about, okay, I'm just going to narrow it down to three and then focus on 60, 30, 10. So that's my encouragement for you and for anybody else that's on the call or listening to the recording is to take your top three things that you want to accomplish over the next couple hours, over the next day, over the next week, and set a, and set and keep great appointments with yourself to focus the time and energy on that. That's another productivity tip that I give as well. And I, in fact, one of the office hours presentations that I gave early on, I think it's within the first 10, was on rapidly increasing your productivity. And one of the tips that I gave in that presentation was on setting and keeping great appointments with yourself, treating yourself as if you were your own very best client. because. Because, and, and in that, not allowing yourself to be interrupted by emails and phone calls, but giving yourself the same courtesy and respect that you give all of the clients that you deal with. Hopefully that was, that was helpful. Next Very question. Helpful. That's yeah. it for the questions I've got on the list. That's, I don't, well, I don't see anything else coming in. There are, there are a, quite a few other questions in the chat log, on the question log, Stephanie, that I'm taking a look at. Um, so I'm going to run through, so you may be able to see those yourself as well. Um, and I have one question from Marcel who says, realizing that leadership is the most important key performance area and taking full responsibility for that, what, what kind of a daily tip would you give yourself uh, for being a better leader? Um, my daily tip for being a daily leader is to keep a, a log of the things you're going to focus on. Every morning for the last number of years, I focus on, my, I focus on defining the top three things that I want to accomplish today. And then throughout the day, I focus on them. And then tomorrow morning, I hold myself accountable to that. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to ask myself, did I accomplish the top three things that were on my list to be accomplished during that day? And if I need to during the day, I continue to remind myself about that. But my key tip for keeping focus is at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day, whichever works for you, is to I review your accomplishments of the previous day and then to focus your on defining those top three things that you want to accomplish in the next work day and then focusing all your time and attention on that. And if the 60-30-10 model applies to that, then that's the way that we make that happen. So daily focus and discipline is real important. One of my blessings is that I'm a very disciplined person. So I'm able to do things every single morning that I know will help me move forward. For sometimes that's exercise. For sometimes it's putting out my energy of the day message that I've done every single day for the last 170 days or 180 days or so. And I anticipate doing every single day for the next thousand days. So becoming a disciplined person is very, very important. Um, and doing that daily review can be very helpful to focus your area on leadership. And Stephanie, did you find the, uh, the questions area on our GoToWebinar here? 
And if not, I'm going to I'm going to read one of the questions and answer it for myself here. Um, Aaron, who I haven't heard from in a while, I'm really glad I was able to attend the call today. Uh, enjoyed learning about the inverted pyramid, and that was his biggest takeaway for the call. So thank you very much, Aaron. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and Walter also says that he understanding how that diagram and thinking about his business in the context of that diagram was was really important to him too. So I'm glad that I did this. I'm glad that um, you know my marketing team, especially Marcel, said, "Paul, go talk about the things that you talk about that nobody else knows about or nobody else is talking about." And these key performance areas, and especially these three insights, are things that I've never heard anybody else talk about directly. Um, and here's a question from uh, from Robin that says, "I have a new client who's not CEO material, and he needs to be." Uh, shifted out of his position, but doesn't seem open to that. How do you handle that? And uh, her note is that it happens frequently. You know, my if if somebody's expectation of reward is strong enough, or their expectation of of pain is frightening enough, that they will make a decision to to make a different choice in their business. So. In some cases, you can teach people that, you know, where their business is just about in the dumper, and you've got to be able to tell them that, hey, you're at risk here. You've got to make yourself, you got to make a decision. Is your decision is either do we continue riding this business right down into the dumpster, or do we make some changes in the business? And if you're not willing to make the changes, then, you know, I typically as a business consultant depart because I, I get no great joy in riding somebody uh, writing somebody as their business goes down into the dumper. Um, so I think if the fear is strong enough or the pain is strong enough or the expectation of reward is strong enough, then somebody will make a change. But there are those people out there that are just are never going to make a change. Uh, I, had a, I had a client once that didn't make a change, which I think was kind of all for the good reasons. He was running a business that had like six million dollars in annual revenues and a twenty percent per year EBITDA, which means operating income. So he was making like you know one point two million dollars a year running his business the way that he wanted to run his business. And so it wasn't like he, he needed to get out of his way to grow the business, but he certainly didn't need to get out of his way to have run a profitable business. And as it turns out, you know, he was in no way encouraged to get out of his way whatsoever. So if the pain is, is, is strong enough or the promise of reward is strong enough and significant enough, I find that people, most people will get out of their way, but unfortunately some people just will not. They, they're running a lifestyle business or they're bound and determined you know, to hang on to the reins of that horse as they ride you know, right over the, the edge of a cliff. Um, I, you, one thing that we might try, Robin, is having somebody else have a conversation with them about you know the ways in which they're not stepping up and see if there's a way to get them out of their own way. Sometimes, by the way, that's the investors. Um, that's why investors like to have a seat on the board of directors. That's why investors a lot of times like to have a controlling interest in the company so that, so that if somebody needs to be replaced as the CEO and they're not willing to have that conversation, that by action of the board that they can, in fact, replace that person as the CEO of the company. Um, because it does happen. Everybody reaches a threshold of competence. That's the Peter principle, right? Peter Drucker a long time ago made that, made that point that everybody rises to their level of incompetence in an organization. And I think we can paraphrase that a little bit to businesses, that almost every business owner grows a business to the point of their own incompetence. Whether that be me or you or anybody else, when we take a look at people like Bill Gates and Larry Ellison, um, and Mark Zuckerberg so far, that those are by far the exceptions to the rule. Now you take a look at 99% of every successful large business out there, and the founders are no longer the CEOs. So if you're founding your own business, you're the CEO of your own business, believe it that, that it's almost a given that at some point in time you're going to grow that business to the level of your own incompetence, and it will be time for you to step aside and enjoy whatever role that you can with the business as chief technology officer or vice president of sales and marketing or 
you know, coach emeritus or whatever you decide to do. You know, enjoy your role with the company and take great pride in having grown it to the point that you grew it, but then step out of the way because that's the right thing for you to do for yourself, for your shareholders, for your employees, for your customers, for your suppliers, for everybody at your business to step out of the way when your mindset, your skill set, your experience no longer allows you to be the best possible leader of your company. So I think that is a great question. And Robin, I'm happy, of course, to help you out on that. Um, and here's another question um, that I'm going to read. And we're coming to the end of it, so I'm going to make this the last question. Um, what are the five most strategic financial statements that are required for leaders to be able to understand and speak intelligently about? Um, so there really are three critical financial statements, the profit and loss statement, the cash flow statement, and the balance sheet statement that I think at some level of business, some level of complexity of business that every business owner needs to understand. My truth is, by the way, that for most small businesses, it's really about profit and loss and cash flow. They don't really need to understand the balance sheet that much because they're not building a business that's transferable. They don't have the intention of selling the business. If you have the intention of selling the business, if you have the intention of having investors in your business or multiple stakeholders in your business, if you're just not the 100% owner of your business, then I think the balance sheet becomes very important as well. In fact, that's the, the last of the business success principles in the Beyond Business Survival Program is understanding the balance sheet, the cash flow statement, and the profit and loss statement or the income statement as the most, the three most important financial statements uh, in business out there. So that's that's generally the rule out there. But again, if you run a, a, a hot dog stand or you run a lemonade stand, you know, if your business is very simple, then you really don't have to understand that. And we're going to be talking about that next week, by the way. Next week, the subject of our presentation is on business complexity profile and business complexity factors. So I invite you to tune in next week again on Monday, June, June the 16th. We'll be talking about your business complexity profile. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today for your great questions. Uh, I want to thank you in advance for tuning in for next week. I really appreciate the opportunity to be a great business consultant, to work with so many of you out there. It means a lot to my heart. It's one of my great passions in life. And so until we meet again, this is Paul Hoyt wishing you a most marvelous and prosperous day. Bye-bye.